And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Sinead Wellahan, a profoundly deaf woman who has had experiences with phenomena since the age of four. In 2017, she consciously met extraterrestrials for the first time, and they have continued to show up in her life ever since. She was a research and interview assistant to ufologist Grant Cameron for two years and is now working with QHHT regression therapist Barbara Lamb. Sinead, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate you having me. Thank you. So let's start with your pivotal experience that you had at age four and go from there. Sure, sure. Um, Well, when I was four, there were three major things that happened. I kind of have a thing about threes. There's been a pattern of threes that's been quite dominant um, directly in accordance with uh, paranormal and unusual experiences I've had all my life. So uh, when I realized that three things had happened when I was four, that was kind of interesting to me. So the first thing was that I was diagnosed with hearing loss. And even though I am profoundly deaf, I have a 90% hearing loss. I use cochlear implants to hear. So I'm part robot in a way, which is kind of neat. Um, At that time, I had a mild to moderate hearing loss. And so I got my first hearing aid when I was four. And that absolutely changed my life because suddenly I could hear birds. I could hear all kinds of things that um, I couldn't hear before. And this is not just about hearing. This is about how my engagement with the world around me and my senses also kind of came alive more at this age. So along with that, I also got very, very, very ill. I had major uh, scarlet fever. I had a, a temperature of 106 and I woke up in the middle of the night one night when I was four and um, was very, very sick out of nowhere. But what was interesting about the experience was that I did not feel sick at all. I felt amazing. I felt probably the best that I've ever felt in my entire life. And so that's kind of funny to me as well. You know, the fact that with this very high fever and this major illness, I felt incredible, you know, and I remember waking up during the middle of the night and feeling, just being aware of all of my senses. And I mean, all of them being on max, you know, I could feel every texture of everything, including my own hair on my skin. I could feel the heat of the room. I could feel, I could hear everything. I could see everything. It was all super sharp and clear. And I felt really good, but I also felt really odd. And so being a little kid, I went to my parents' bedroom, woke up my mother. She kind of sleepily, groggily, you know, put her hand on my forehead. And then as soon as she felt how burning hot I was, she shot up and then came out and took care of me. But um, that fever seemed to, Grant Cameron seems to think that that fever was the beginning of something for me, because also around this time was the third thing that happened. And the third thing that happened was I was around four, I was in my room, my father was putting me to bed. And for some reason, um, I asked to be put to bed upside down, meaning with my head where my feet usually were and my feet where my head usually was. And I remember just feeling compelled to do this. and. What was also weird about it is that when I was doing that with my father there, you know, and my so my my dad, my parent is there and I'm in my room and, you know, I'm in a safe environment, I started feeling scared and I still felt compelled to sleep like this. And so, you know, we set me up. My dad said good night. He left. And then almost immediately the atmosphere in the room changed. It was as if it became incredibly electrically charged And all the hairs on my arms and on the back of my neck and on my head started to stand up. And then I just knew that there was a presence in the room with me and it was directly behind me. It was actually right behind my body on the bed, it felt like, but also sort of in the wall. And so not a huge amount happened, but this being laughed at me and it was this sort of cackling Um, mocking kind of laughter. It was very negative and scary. And this is the only time I've ever had a scary or unpleasant experience like that. Every other experience I've ever had has only been positive. I know that's not true for everyone, but for me it is. So this is the only one that was scary. And after talking to Grant Cameron about it, he suggested that um, the fear, um, the fear part which you could maybe even loosely label trauma because I was really terrified, like really rigid with fear. Um, But that somehow it broke me open 
to being able to have these other experiences that that seems to have been the start of everything else that has happened since. And um, so maybe it needed to be big. It needed to kind of crack me open in a way in order for me able to re- me to be able to receive other things. I'm not really sure, but it was a huge experience. And I ran downstairs to my parents once I was able to unfreeze myself from my paralysis because I was so afraid of what was going on. Um, I ran downstairs and told my parents. And of course they said, oh, it's just a bad dream. But I was wide awake. I hadn't gone to sleep. I was absolutely wide awake. I was completely conscious of what was going on. And I felt this being, that I felt this presence. I heard the laughter and I felt it leave as well. So the laughter became fainter and fainter as it went away. And that changed something for me. The fever and being able to hear again and having this experience. I just remember feeling different. I can't explain how or why it was a long time ago, but that seemed to have been the start of a lot of other things that have happened to me since. Are you saying that this being visited you during the same time that you had the scarlet fever? No, um, that would, they were two separate occasions, but they were within the same year of life. I'm kind of like Grant, and I think something may have happened to you also at four. My first thoughts were perhaps you had an NDE, but maybe you had some type of NDE-like experience. And since you're involved in QHHT, have you ever been regressed back I to that? Have. I have. Yeah. Barbara, Barbara and uh, Lamb and I are good friends and I'm doing a series of interviews with her for her YouTube channel about her life and her experiences. But um, in the process of getting to know each other, she off- she offered to do a regression with me and she couldn't get me under. And I'm not sure if that's because, um, you know, with my hearing loss, when I am listening, like when I have my cochlear implants on, my brain is concentrating on catching sound. And it's it's fully on. Like I can't really turn it off. So the only time I take things off and I have complete silence, you can literally drop a bomb beside me, not literally, but you can drop something beside me and I will just keep on sleeping peacefully. I can't hear anything. Um, that's the only time that I take them off and my brain can really relax. So when I was in the regression with Barbara, I feel like it might have been because I was concentrating so hard on what she was saying and I'd never had a regression before at that point. Maybe I wasn't able to fully relax and get into it, but um, she's so skillful and she's so gentle. And she did help me make a connection with um, the original ET experience I'd had in Peru in 2017 in that regression, something that was very helpful. So, yeah, I had a regression, but nothing happened. Not yet. Did you say that when this being was in your room, you were paralyzed? And if so, would, would that be like sleep paralysis? No, it wasn't like sleep paralysis. It was just fear, just really, really intense fear. And I think it's that kind of fight or flight, you know, the body just, our biological system just either stops and freezes or runs away, you know? So I think it was just that base human reaction to what was going on. And I was so young, you know, I didn't know what to do, right? It didn't even occur to me to to try to leave my room until I was able to unfreeze myself. But I actually did get to a point where I gathered all my courage and I turned over to see if the being really was behind me. And of course there was nothing there, but the presence in the room was, it was a remarkable, remarkable sort of electrical energy. It felt like electricity. Yeah. Almost as if the way you feel electricity in the air just before a storm comes. It was kind of like that. Now that you're older and you've had ET experience, do you think it was an ET or some dark entity? I don't think it was an ET. Um, I don't even know if it was a dark entity. I don't tend to think of things as being one way or the other. I'm very much a middle path, gray area kind of person. I think that um, we live in a in a reality that is made up of duality. That's my personal perspective. I think that everything that we experience in this du- in this reality in this dimension, if you want to call it that, is dualistic, including ourselves. And so, I don't think anything, at least in my experience so far, is is ever one hundred percent bad or one hundred percent good. Because if I think about it like this. That experience with the being I had when I was four, it was terrifying. I did not feel like the being was trying to help me. I felt like it was mocking me and laughing at me. But look what's happened since. You know, nothing but positivity. And I have been a very sensitive person since childhood. You know, I've had all kinds of psychic experiences, EST experiences, you know, intuitive experiences. Maybe I wouldn't have had those if this being hadn't shown up 
and sort of cracked me open to this energy. So even though it was very, very scary, um, and I can't say I would want that to happen again, I don't think of it as being a trauma or a negative thing that happened to me or something that has followed me through my life. It was just a big experience that sort of somehow blasted something open for me. I don't know how to explain it better than that. I don't know if you believe in pre-birth planning, but if you do, do you think that you planned this deafness? Uh, oh, yes, I do. Um, I, I I don't know either if I believe that. I mean, I think it's an interesting, a very interesting idea that would certainly make sense in some ways. You know, this, this concept of um, planning out our lives so that we can give ourselves lessons we need to learn. I like that idea. I, I'm, I kind of hope it is that way. I definitely believe in reincarnation. Um, and I hope that I have chosen all the god awful experiences I've had in my life <laughs> because that would make it a little bit easier to swallow. Um, but you know, I am a big believer in learning. I'm, I'm a really, really dedicated student in life to learning from whatever occurs, whether it's so called good or so called bad. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think all the learning is important, you know, whether it's uncomfortable or not. Do you think there's any purpose for your deafness? I do. Um, I really do. I feel like it has been a major benefit to me in my life. It has helped me be empathetic, compassionate. Um, I've been the underdog, you know, in some ways in life also as a female. Um, you know, I've definitely had privileges, but as a person with a disability and as a female, I've had, you know, I've been in the underdog position lots of times in my life. So when you're in the underdog position, you get to see the vulnerable um, side of human nature in yourself and in other people that are there with you in that situation. And I think that that's a really helpful thing to experience because it allows you to have empathy and compassion. But also, um, most importantly, my deafness has taught me how to listen on a really, really deep level. And it's a skill I feel like I've been developing for a really long time, consciously, like on purpose. You know, once I reached a certain level of maturity, I was developing it on purpose because I realized that I was quite intuitive and that I could hear people when when they weren't necessarily verbalizing what they what they meant or felt or wanted to say. It's sort of what's between people's words, what's behind their words, or, you know, how people communicate, not just with their mouths, but also with their eye movements, their eye expressions, their facial expressions, their body language, you know, their energy, their vibration, like there's so many different ways that we communicate It's not just through speech. And we also don't only hear with our ears, we hear with our whole system, we hear with our energy, we hear with our intuition, you know, we hear with a lot of things that I think, are not given enough credit in our society and culture these days. We're very based on the physical and it's the ears that hear. And if the ears don't work, then you don't really work fully as a hearing person. But I find that's not really true. You know, I'm very much about consciousness and about the mind. And I think that the body is a tool for us to use, but I don't think that the body is us. So the deafness to me is not just a physical thing. To me, my deafness is a spiritual experience, but it's also a chance for me to exercise my consciousness and my conscious abilities in ways that can go beyond my body. Do you think that what happened to you at four with the being is your most significant spiritually transformative experience or was there something later that happened to you that was bigger? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I've had several. Uh, since 2017, my life has changed very dramatically as a result of experiences I've had. And it's definitely been ETs who have been at the forefront of that. So the first one was there's there's been three so far, almost exactly two years apart, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I'm actually due for another one. If if that two-year pattern is going to continue, I'm due for one this summer. So who knows what's going to happen? They did show up again fairly recently, and I'll tell you about that. But initially what happened was um, I went to Peru and I felt a very strong pull to go to Peru. So I guess you could say I was called to go to Peru and uh, all kinds of synchronicities were involved and the trip came, came together just like that so smoothly. Um, and I went and I had a whole bunch of incredible experiences, but the biggest one was that I met ETs for the first time and um, it was a, just a massive, massive, massive experience, uh, massive energy. It followed me, you know, the experience continued for the rest of the night. It, it even followed me back home to Toronto where I live. I'm Canadian. Um, 
it followed me back home, you know, two weeks after that. It was just really amazing experience. And then almost almost exactly two years later, in August of 29, July of 2019, I had a massive awakening. And um, I'm only using the word awakening. It doesn't really fit for me because I feel like I was already working very hard on myself and having other experiences. But this was the biggest one. I call it getting bonged on the head with the cosmic frying pan. It really felt like that. I felt like it felt like the, the ETs just bonged me over the head with this massive, massive cast iron skillet and said, OK, it's time. You know, we've been with you all along. We're here now. OK, you got a job to do. This is what we're going to do. And I had, I was not in ufology at all before this. And I mean, at all. I was not thinking about ETs. I was not thinking about UFOs. I was curious. I believe that the universe is definitely a bigger and more mysterious place than we could ever possibly know. And it definitely made no sense to me that we would be the only civilized so-called life in, in the universe or the only life in the universe at all here on earth. That makes no sense. But I was not in this field whatsoever. And after that experience happened, it was like I got slingshot into the field. Within six months, I was working with Grant Cameron. It just came out of nowhere. And then the third big experience was in Illinois in August of 2021. So again, almost exactly two years afterwards, where uh, a being appeared in front of me at a CE5 presentation and proceeded to give me a massive energy merge that went on for several hours. And I have a photograph that I'm going to share with you in the audience that's related to that story. So there's been several pretty big ones and also um, big lessons that I've been taught. One was surrender. And so um, that was, a, it's hard to describe how they provide guidance. And I'm not even sure it is the ETs, to be honest with you. I feel like there are other beings that are also around. I'm getting that feeling more and more now because I, I get a different sense of who's there based on the vibration and the kind of voice that comes with it. Um, so there were some beings around me that guided me to this process of surrender, which was really about letting go of controlling my life or myself and surrendering to trusting the universe and trusting that I had beings around me who were helping me and that I was going to be given guidance and support and that I had to make some very big decisions in terms of changing my life, which I have done as a result of this surrender lesson. Um, and it was very profound for me. And so, you know, there's been so many experiences, Jeff, I could go on and on. There's been a lot of them, small ones, medium-sized, big ones, but they've all been really important to me and really valuable to me. Well, tell us about the first one. Did you see an actual, like, being? Yes. So what happened was... Um, I had been very seriously depressed. I was really, really depressed and really anxious. And I had been for many, many years before that. So I was kind of getting to a dark night of the soul kind of point in my life where I was just thinking, you know, I feel like I've lost touch with myself. I want to get back to how I was when I was a child, when I was so connected and I was able to, you know, I had psychic abilities and intuitive abilities and ESP abilities. And why have they gone away? And who am I now? Like, where, where am I in my life? What am I doing? You know, why does any of this, what is all of this for? I was really in this very existential crisis kind of place. And uh, Peru just kind of called me. And so I went and uh, the first half of the trip was a sacred tour through, or sorry, a spiritual tour through the sacred valley of the Incas. And that was incredible, absolutely incredible. So I'm not somebody who's ever done plant medicine, meaning psychedelics. I've never been a partier. I was not a raver in the 90s. I was not somebody who ever did a lot of partying or drug use. Um, I was pretty conservative. I was very, you know, afraid of taking risks. I was very anxious and very much about controlling my environment. So I went to Peru and just went straight to the mothership and um, went to ayahuasca for the second half of my time in Peru during a retreat in the, the jungle of Peru. So the first half of the trip in the sacred valley of the Incas was the first time I ever tried anything that was psychedelic or plant medicine related. And it was incredible. It was an absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful experience. I saw all kinds of crazy things that I didn't know how to make sense of until I went into the jungle and took ayahuasca. So just as a little bit more of an example of how threes show up. So um, I ended up being in Peru for three weeks. I didn't plan it that way. It just happened like that. The third week was the week that we were doing the ayahuasca ceremonies. 
Um, we were supposed to take ayahuasca for three nights. Nothing happened to me on the first night. I was lying there in the Mallorca, the um, ceremonial hut. I was lying there like, I'm here, you know, <laughs> come and communicate with me. I'm open. I'm receptive. I'm ready. I want to learn. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. And I fell asleep and I got a lecture from the shaman the next day about that. Second night, again, nothing happened. I'm like, I'm here. I'm here. Nothing happened. Third night, wham, there it was. So on the third night, and again, another three, just for a bit of reference, I had been placed in hut number three in the uh, resort area, in the retreat area. So um, in any case, we went in and into the Mallorca on this third night, and the two Peruvian shamans that were, th were there uh, were leading us through the ceremony. And so one by one, we're supposed to go up to the shaman and take our drink of ayahuasca. And so because nothing had happened the previous two nights, my dosage was upped just a bit, half a cup or a quarter of a cup or so. And uh, it was the right dosage because almost immediately I started feeling it. And again, I'd never done uh, psychedelics before or ayahuasca before, so I didn't know what to expect. And I had done only the appropriate amount of research just to make sure I was choosing a really responsible retreat center that was going to you know, handle all of this carefully and with ethics and morality and, you know, safety standards in place. Um, I had done that, but I hadn't looked into ayahuasca in great depth, what kind of experiences people had, because I didn't want to have anything already in my mind. I just wanted to go in and be open to what was going to happen. So again, at this time, no, in, no interest or involvement in ufology whatsoever. And what ended up happening was, um, the short version is I was in, I was inside a UFO all of a sudden I'm inside a UFO and I knew, I just knew that I was inside a UFO. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm in a UFO. Where's this coming from? Like I have no connection to UFOs at this point. Right. So, but I know I'm in one and I can see around me this massive circular shape and it's very, very dark. And above me, it looks like the ceiling of it is kind of translucent and I can see up into the galaxy and then around all the way around it is this beautiful, beautiful purple light that is showing me the circumference of the UFO. And it's very, very large. And so then I'm sitting there and then underneath me, um, I start to see this grid forming. So it was as if I was sitting on, then the UFO disappears and it's like, I'm sitting on the grid of the universe. That's what it felt like. Like I was just floating out in the universe and underneath my body, were lines of light that were going out forever and ever and ever in every, as far as I could see in every direction. And um, those lines were crossed by other lines of light. So it was kind of like I was sitting on a web or a grid. And at every point that the lines touched, there was a bead of light. So I'm sit seeing all of this. And then I'm outside the UFO. And there's a whole bunch of light beings in front of me. And I knew that they were light beings and that there were more than one of them because I could see them as light beings um, individually, but I could also hear all their voices and I could hear their, <laughs> this was the best part about it, their enormous excitement to see me. They were just absolutely 1000% excited to see me. And it was just, finally, you can see us. Finally, you're here. Finally, finally, you know, that was this feeling of, celebration like they had been trying to reach me and finally they got through and then um so they were made of light but they were like flowers and lines and dots and fireworks and wheels that were spinning and moving and they were all very very excited and joyful and spinning and moving and sort of creating little sparks of light and they were all talking to me and saying okay okay um now we're gonna go up we're going to take you up. And we're going to show you stuff. And um, the greeting part went on for quite a while. And we were just interacting and experiencing the joy of greeting each other. Um, and they were saying, okay, like they were, it was almost like they were very eager or impatient, you know, like they had been waiting for a long time and they didn't have any more time to waste and it was time to go. So they were trying to get me to come on the UFO and go up with them. And they were going to show me things. But ayahuasca is very hard on the physical body. And so you do a lot of purging. And I was very distracted by this point by my stomach. So I could feel my stomach getting really burbly and starting to, you know, make noises and feel uncomfortable. 
And so I kept getting kind of pulled back into my physicality, pulled back into my body and very aware of the embarrassment that could occur with this physical body if I were really were to let go and go up with them, right? So in the end, my ego kind of stepped in and um, my feelings of embarrassment. And I said to them, I'm really sorry, I can't do this. I'm really uncomfortable. I have to go to the bathroom. You know, I can't stay. I can't go up with you. And I was going to vomit or something. I didn't know. So in any case, um, they said, okay. And there was no judgment or anything like that. They, there was no even feeling of disappointment. It was just, okay. And so then um, I went and purged and came back. And when I was coming back, I could feel them leaving. I could feel their voices going more and more faintly up into the sky. And I said, no, wait, wait, don't go. And they said, don't worry. With this really calm feeling and this really this voice that they have, um, I feel it every time they communicate with me, it's this loving, calm, powerful, parental kind of voice. It's really a very strong experience to hear that. And it's a wonderful experience. And so they said, don't worry, this is your invitation. And I thought, okay, this is my invitation. I don't know what that means. Then I went through this whole process of trying to digest the fact that that had just happened. And I was thinking, how could my mind, at first it was, oh, my mind created that. You know, I created that I was in, inside a UFO. I created that I met these beings. But the more I thought about it, and then the more unusual things started to unfold over more and more and more after I got back home from Peru, I realized that just wasn't the case. And also, why would I manifest something that was not involved in my life at all? I wasn't involved in ufology. I wasn't involved in the ET world. I wasn't thinking about them at all. So why would I have created that? It didn't really make sense. And then over time, it started adding up. And now they show up almost like I can I can ask them to show up and they sometimes will. So that happened recently in New York. Do you think that previously to this life, you were also an ET from another planet and they're just trying to reach out to you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, what I can tell you is something I know you've heard from guests before. You know, I don't feel like I fit in here. I don't feel like I've ever really fit in here. You know, um, I've never been able to be normal. And everybody who knows me well knows that I've had a really hard time with fitting into norms. I just don't do them very well. And so... Um, I, there's a lot about human behavior. I don't really understand that, that I have difficulty with. Um, there's a lot of social cues and things about just how human beings are with each other and what seems like a very easeful, natural way that for me have not been easeful or natural. And I've had to teach myself. And I've also always felt like I'm observing. I've never really felt like I'm part of what's going on around me. I'm, I'm observing, you know, um, and I think my deafness was helpful for me in that way as well, because I was the only kid I knew growing up. I never met any other kids who had hearing loss. So I was always the one on kind of on the outside observing and studying everyone else and developing coping skills, right, and abilities to function um, and disguise my hearing loss. But in general, I've never really, um, there's a lot of things about life on earth I just don't relate to and I don't understand. Yeah. So in that sense, maybe. In that sense, also, um, I feel very comfortable with ETs being in my life. I feel comfortable with the communication. It's not something that's ever felt scary or overwhelming or too much to me. It just feels familiar and it feels like it makes sense. So maybe that indicates something. So how did your life change after this? Did you start reading books about ETs and watching movies or, or, or did you become no. more interested? No, I didn't. So I went to Peru 2017, had this big experience, um, had a bunch of crazy synchronicities when I got back home around ayahuasca, mostly around ayahuasca and Peru and shamanism. Um, and I did feel like that experience had really changed me and helped me. And, you know, I felt energized and inspired and reconnected with myself by the time I came back. So I was kind of focusing on that, but I was still struggling with uh, living a life that wasn't really right for me. And um, I was a public school teacher and I was working all the time and it was really burning me out. I was exhausted. So I feel like I was very caught up with this, the kind of mundane in my face responsibilities and obligations of my life at that time. And I wasn't really able to get into it, but it was still sticking with me a bit. I just wasn't taking a lot of action. So then when 2019 happened and I got my bonged over the head with the cosmic frying pan, 
um, that was a huge, huge, immediately, completely life-changing experience. I mean, I was not the same person after that experience happened, literally right after. I immediately became a vegetarian. I couldn't eat animals anymore. Um, I stopped certain things I had been doing, certain things I had been saying that I realized were not good for me or were not beneficial for me or not beneficial for people around me. And I immediately decided to stop working in the public school system. I was going to move away from that. I was going to um, just change really fundamental dynamics in my life with regard to relationships I had, choices I was making, um, the pillars in my life, like career, people I spent time with, how I was choosing to spend my time, what I was eating, so many different things, but but mostly my paradigm was just completely busted. You know, I realized that, hang on a second, this is not that all there is to life. I was right, because I'd always had this feeling from the time I was a child that there was something more. There was just more, and I didn't know what it was, and I was determined to find it. So from the time I was really little, and definitely from the time I was 10, and I started journaling when I was 10 years old, I was just seeking and seeking and trying to find whatever this more was. And tried all kinds of different things. I lived in a Buddhist temple, shaved off all my hair, gave away all my, my belongings, moved into this temple, was going to become a monastic. I went and, you know, was going to become a yoga um, teacher and live in an ashram and teach yoga in the Himalayas. I was going to do all kinds of different things. But none of them ever really felt quite right. And then this was the one that did. They showed up, bonged me over the head, told me they'd always been with me, told me they were there with me now, told me that I have a responsibility in this life to spread awareness of the fact that we are cosmic, all of us human beings, not earthly. And, uh, you know, the energy of it was absolutely massive. It stayed with me for about two months afterwards and everything changed, everything. Yeah. So what happened that you consider it being bonged over the head? Well, so first of all, as I said, I'm a deaf person and I was having my second cochlear implant surgery. I had had hearing aids all my life and they were not powerful enough for me anymore. So my hearing loss had gotten profound enough that I needed a stronger, more sophisticated technology. And so I decided to have my second cochlear implant surgery. And um, so I had that surgery. It's a major surgery. You know, they cut your head open, they go into your inner ear system and you get dizzy for about 24, well, 24 seven for about two weeks. And uh, it's not vertigo or anything really terrible, or at least not for me, but I was very dizzy. So I couldn't do a lot. I could just basically just lie around healing and eating soup and, you know, watching TV. That was really all I could do. Couldn't go for a walk. I might fall over, couldn't read a book. It made me dizzier. So all I could do was watch things. And by the time the two weeks was almost over, I was so incredibly bored. And I just had been watching bajillions of movies and, you know, TV shows and stuff. Um, and I thought to myself, I want to see something totally different. You know, I want to just, I, I need something different, something refreshing. So I was just mulling around, you know, scoping out what was on Netflix. And uh, I found the Bob Lazar and Area 51 documentary. Watched it blew my mind, immediately believed him. I just felt like he had real authenticity right off the bat. I just believed him. And uh, I'm a critical thinker, but I just felt like this man is telling the truth. I could hear it in his voice. And also, if you look up, if you look up what's happened with his story ever since, his, his story has now been validated. I didn't know that at the time. But it wasn't related to Area 51 and UFOs. And so I was just flabbergasted. I thought, wow, this is incredible. I have to learn more about this. And I remember this. I got off the couch, crawled across the floor because I was very dizzy, and turned off the film. And immediately after I turned it off, the ETs just arrived. Now, I didn't see them physically with my eyes, but I felt them. It was like people had just arrived in my space. I felt different beings in the room with me. The energy was indescribable, absolutely indescribable. It was this massive, massive, massive energy and a really, really massive vibration. And I just became infused with it. And um, I heard them speaking to me and they just said, okay, we're here. It's time that you know that we're here. It's time for you to understand what's really going on and that you, um, you, you know, a big part of your life and what you're supposed to be doing here is helping to spread the message that we are cosmic beings. Um, and it was other messages too, but I can't verbalize them because it was really like a vibrational energy transfer. 
Um, that's how most of the information has come through. So I used to have massive downloads, for example, between the age of, I think, nine and 11 when I was a kid. And that was also a huge amount of energy that would just come into my body all of a sudden. And with this full concept, a full idea, you know, something completely understood would arrive in my mind. A complex idea with all the details and all the content would just be there all of a sudden, as if I had read a whole book in a second. So it was like that. It was kind of like that feeling. And then the the vibration was so incredibly large and, and potent that I felt it 24-7 for about two months afterwards. Um, so I just knew... I, you know, it's that feeling that experiencers often talk about. I just knew, I just knew it was ETs. I knew what they were telling me. I knew it was real. And believe me, I had moments after that of doubting myself, but then I would ask them for validation and they would give me ridiculous validation that was absolutely undeniable. So an example of that is that, you know, I'm a teacher. This happened in the summer. I had my awakening in July. And then later on that month, about two weeks after this big cosmic frying pan experience happened, um, I had already been hired months before to, to mark government literacy tests. So there are these booklets that are sent out to kids all over the country. I'm in Canada, sent out to kids all over the country in grade six to test their math and their literacy. So I was hired to mark these booklets and score them You know, to, to track the data for the kids all over the country in terms of what their literacy levels were. So I started this job and it's in a massive warehouse and there are all these tired teachers, you know, trudging in with big things of coffee, you know, chugging down their coffee through the day and marking these booklets. And it was just such dry work in this big, huge, empty warehouse. And, you know, we'd get cattle called back after breaks and stuff. It felt like it felt like such a massive juxtaposition to the vibration that I had experienced just a short while before that I started to feel like, oh my God, I have gone crazy. That didn't actually happen. This is real life. That's not real life. Oh my God. You know, so I started getting worried about myself. And I went home one day after work, three days after I started this job and came home and I was very upset. And I just said, you know, I started talking to them out loud and I'm not someone who grew up religious. I don't pray. You know, I never prayed in my life but I just started talking to them and I was sitting on the floor of my living room, crying a little bit, really, really distressed and stressed out, wondering if I was mentally well. And, uh, and I asked them, you know, if this is really true and this really happened, I need you to prove it to me. I need you to prove it to me in a way that is absolutely undeniable and unmistakable, not something that maybe is proof, something that is absolutely undeniable. And so then I, um, felt this very warm, soothing presence around me. And I relaxed and I felt better. And I went to bed, woke up the next day, drove to work. It started as usual. You know, this guy who's running our particular room, there's 50, 50 or 60 teachers in this one segmented room. And we have a team leader and he's up at the front of the room saying, okay, everybody, the quota for today's booklets is blah, blah, blah. This is what our schedule is. So uh, we get started and what we're supposed to do is just walk up to the front of the room where there's this massive floor to ceiling shelf and just grab a random stack of booklets, bring them back to our desk and start marking them. Well, on that particular day, I went up and I pulled this random stack of booklets off the shelf, brought them back to my desk, opened them up, and I start marking what we're supposed to mark exactly the same question over and over and over and over again. Right. So each kid answers the question differently. These are kids who are 10, 11 years old. They're in grade six. They're supposed to be writing about the day they became famous. It's a, a fiction. It's a creative writing challenge for them that day for 45 minutes from nine o'clock until nine forty five. Every single booklet I opened. ETs, UFOs, flying cars, free energy, portals, the earth is alive, the galaxy is full of other beings. I was reading this in front of me. It has nothing to do with the original prompt, the day I became famous, nothing to do with it. And here are these kids in writing, in pencil, in six, you know, 10 to 11 year old child writing. There's a portal in my bedroom. I designed time travel. I made a time machine. The earth is alive and conscious. She knows what we're all doing on her. There are spaceships out there. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. 
And so we were not allowed to take breaks that early in the morning, but I just said, I have to, I raised my hand and said, I need to go to the washroom. And I went to the washroom and I texted a bunch of friends of mine who I had met by that point in the community. Um, because immediately after my awakening, I just started reaching out to people for help. I needed to understand what was going on. So I connected with the lovely Costa McCreas, who you have interviewed. Mm -hmm. He was immediately there for me to support me. And so I texted him and a couple of other people he had introduced me to and just said, I just have to tell you that this is, I need to tell you this happened. And I need you to tell me if this is real. Did this really just happen? Meanwhile, there are hairs standing straight up on my arms and I'm in the stall in the bathroom furiously typing this. They all wrote me back and I said, yep, this is what happens. You know, this is exactly it. I mean, how can you deny that? You cannot deny that that is validation. Not to mention when I came back from the bathroom, um, the rest of the booklets that were on my desk, I think there were three or four left. None of them have any had anything to do with it. It was all back to the question. And for the rest of the day, it was the actual question that was being answered by the students. I became famous because of YouTube. I became famous because of this. It was only that 45 minutes that all those booklets, one after another, had this content. It absolutely blew my mind. And ever since then, if I really need them to show up, they will. If we go back to that experience and you said you heard those voices, I think this is especially interesting because of your cochlear implants. Do you mm -hmm. hear them in your voice in your head or do you hear like some other completely different voice, something that sounds human or alien and male or female? Well, here's the thing. Um, it's not really a voice. It's like... It's really hard to describe. Um, I'm not actually hearing voices. It's like, it's it's a language, but it's it, it's a full language that I totally understand. And I understand what they're saying to me, but it's not really words. It's a vibration. So the, the language is, the vibration is the language and just somehow I understand it. And then every once in a while, I will get a word or a phrase that is you know, definitively in English and I hear a voice, but it's like, it's so hard to describe. Again, I just, I just know it's not my voice. It's not my vibration. It's coming from outside of me and it would be completely random things that I would not have been thinking about. So it's, it's, it's someone else. I just know it is. And over time, because I've questioned myself so thoroughly, you know, I will check in with myself and be like, okay, am I making this up, right? Did I create this experience myself because I want something to happen or did this actually happen? So I'm always questioning myself and I'm always asking for validation and I will bounce things off of other people too, because it's important to me that in talking about these experiences that sound so weird to so many people, it's important to me that I'm as grounded as possible and that I'm validating these things for myself. So if I feel like I may be getting, um, you know, guidance or a message or a prompting from someone else, a being that's around me, sometimes I'll hear it and I'll just say, okay, I hear you. I heard that. Can you give me some more? And then I'll just wait. And then they give me more. So it's interesting how that will happen. If it's just me, I know it's me. So over time, I've gotten to know better and better when it's not me and when it is me. I think that's really important, right? I don't think it's helpful in this field. Um, I don't think it's helpful to other experiencers or to researchers or to interviewers like yourself if people don't really check in with themselves and make sure that what's happening is really happening because we can, our minds are incredible things. We can create all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm really careful about that, asking myself when it's real and what isn't. Have you ever questioned that these hearing problems that you've had throughout your life predisposed you to be able to hear these ETs when other people cannot? Yes, I have. And I do think it is part of it. Yes. And actually, one of the messages I've gotten over and over and over again is that part of my job or my role or my responsibility in this life is to be a communicator, that I'm supposed to communicate um, what I experience and share it with other people and communicate in a particular way. And I think that that's why it's become so important to me to be grounded and to be as authentic and, you know, have as much integrity in this as I can. But the hearing loss in terms of making me a receptor to this kind of communication, yes, I do, because I have learned so much how 
listening is is not just with our ears. It's with our minds. It's with our energy fields. It's with our intuitions. So yes, I really do feel like it's helpful to me in that way. Now, during this experience, you didn't see them, but you felt them in your space. Mm -hmm. And you also felt the being in your space when you were four. Mm -hmm. Can you compare the two? Yes. Um, so the being when I was four was powerful. There was a lot of energy, um, very electrical energy, huge vibration. But this feeling of um, being mocked or teased or laughed at. And the experience with the ETs was completely different and always is. It's always with love, support, a huge amount of strength, a huge amount. Of, it feels like they're my parents. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it better than that. It's, 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 you know, the ideal parent that you would imagine somebody who really sees you and they really hear you and they really understand you and they see the true you and they want to support that and encourage it. And they want you to be happy and they want you to be powerful and they want you to feel um, like your truest self in your life and live your best life, so to speak. That's what it feels like. It's this very nurturing, very kind, very loving, supportive, guiding um, energy. It always has been. Yeah. All right. So you had one in 2017 and then 2019. That was the cosmic frying pan. Yeah. Okay. And then so... I, th I was starting to think every three years, but those are every two years. Have you had a third one yet? Yes. In 2021, I was at um, an event that's run by a friend of mine, Deb Frew. She creates a really wonderful event in Illinois every year called the Worldwide Metaphysical Tribe. And at the time, I was assisting Grant. And so we went to this um, event together. He was the keynote speaker, and I was going to be assisting him and also doing a little presentation of my own about Sasquatch. and. Um, so during the middle of the day, Grant was supposed to, to speak later that night. In the middle of the day at about one o'clock, um, or sorry, two o'clock, there was a presentation that was going to be delivered by a couple friends of mine uh, on CE5, which is close encounters of the fifth kind and how to do that, how to do CE, how you can initiate contact with ETs, you know, what you can do to make that happen. So they were talking about this and they were talking about this, you know, the history of CE5, but really it was all about ET contact. And so during that presentation, about an hour into it at around three o'clock, interestingly, um, I was just sitting there and I felt this very strong hole, almost like a voice, look over here, look over here. And so what was happening was I was sitting at the very, in the very front row of this presentation space. The presentation was happening at about a 45 degree angle to my right. So I was supposed to be looking over in this direction, right towards my right. There was no reason for me to look straight ahead. There was just a tall green ever, evergreen hedge. We were outside in an enclosed space, but there were no walls, just a roof covering. So all around us was garden. And so I could see the hedge and uh, there was nothing to look at. And so I kind of looked at it and went, mm, there's nothing there, okay. So I went back to the presentation, but again, I felt, no, no, look over here. And so again, I looked away at the hedge, which was about 15, 20 feet away from me. And this being materialized in front of me. And I sat there just kind of going, you know, like, is this really happening? I even pinched myself and was asking myself, having this conversation in my, in my head, is this really happening? Am I seeing this? And then kind of narrating it. Yeah, there's a head. Oh my God, there's a neck. Oh, there's, so this being appeared in front of me. It was a misty kind of um, outline, filled in outline, very tall being, maybe about seven feet tall, very thin, um, thin neck, long, thin arms, thin body, thin legs. And this fits the description of uh, the tall grays. Some people call them the tall grays. At this time, this was not going into my mind. I was just amazed that I was actually witnessing this. And there's 50 people sitting behind me. And Grant is sitting right beside me in the middle of the day, in the afternoon. So I was just flabbergasted. And then the being says to me, this is an energy, sorry, this is an energy merge. And I thought, at first I thought it was my own thought. And I thought, why did I think that? I don't know what an energy merge is. Right. And then the being just basically starts blasting me with this energy. So it was as if I was in front of a fire hose or, you know, a water cannon. And this energy was just getting blasted at me. And so the being is standing directly in front of me, directing this right at me. And this went on for the rest of the presentation for about an hour. So during this period of time, 
my mouth goes completely numb. My whole body goes almost numb. I'm, I'm tingling and buzzing with this really, really strong vibration. And again, the energy is absolutely overwhelming. I can't describe it. It's massive, massive, massive energy and vibration. And uh, the room around me changed. I couldn't really see surfaces very much anymore. And my body felt totally different. I felt like the edges of my body were no longer there. So having this massive experience, the presentation ends. At this point, it's an hour into the energy merge and the being just sort of dissipates at the end of the presentation. People stand up, they start moving around and I'm just sitting there. I can't move. My mouth is numb. My body does not feel like my body. I can't get up. So my friend Kim, who was one of the presenters, had seen me looking and behaving a bit weirdly during the presentation and staring at this hedge for an hour. <laughs> so she came over and said, are you OK? And I couldn't really talk. Again, my mouth was frozen, right? Um, but I sort of got out enough that she understood what might have happened. And so she took me into this little gazebo where we could have some privacy. I was in no place to interact with anyone. And uh, she sat with me and she helped me just, she just kept me company while I was trying to digest all this energy. So what happened in the gazebo was a whole bunch of things, but because we're leaning towards this photograph, I'm going to show you. Um, I was feeling all this energy in my body and the beings were showing me in the middle of my body, this, this column of light that was just going straight through my body and up into the sky and way down to the earth. And then also there was a point of light somewhere way off in front of me and they had beamed it at my forehead. Never had this happen before. Also near the end of this experience, this went on for several hours. I'm giving you the really short version here, but near the end of this experience in the gazebo, I saw in my mind all of the energy running up from my extremities and being sucked into what looked like a sort of whirlpool in my chest. So it was as if, you know, it was running from my toes, up my calves, through my knees, my thighs, out through my body, into my chest, from my arms, into my chest. So like there was a vacuum cleaner and it was just sucking it all up and I could see it swirling around and disappearing into my chest. So then um, I, again, couldn't really speak, couldn't move very easily. I needed to have some help to get up to my bedroom where I could just collapse for a little bit. And the being showed up again there for a short period of time. And then I fell asleep out of nowhere. I don't remember falling asleep for two hours. Woke up out of this sleep, felt completely normal again. And it was almost time for Grant's presentation. And so I ran downstairs, assisted him with that. I don't know how I did that. I was completely out of it, but I did it. And then um, Grant knew at that point that something had happened. So he sat me down and asked me what had gone on. I described it to him. And then we were late for the C5 that was happening across the street in front of a cemetery. Um, at the, this, we were staying at a little B&B &B where this event was happening. So the cemetery was right across the road. And there was this big C5 happening with all the attendees. So we walked over to the C5. Now, from here, everything that happened was told to me because I really am very deaf, even though I don't look or sound like it, I really am. So in the dark, I can't hear people because I can't see your mouth. I can't see your facial expression and I can't see your body language. So I could hear that you're saying something. I can hear voice, but I don't know what is actually being said. So we start walking, Grant and I start walking towards the CE5 circle. As we're getting closer to the circle, and then as we walk into the circle and sit down in our seats, people in the circle start saying, whoa, 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 what is that? There's really huge energy that's just come into the circle. What is that? What is that? And I'm not hearing any of this, right? Grant tells me this later on. So they're all saying, whoa, whoa. And so Marcel, who is leading the CE5, he's feeling this as well. And he says, yeah, some really big energy just came in. Can everyone just pause for a second? They had been meditating. And please point to where you see the energy. And in the dark, they all pointed to where I was sitting. I couldn't see this. I couldn't hear this. I didn't know this was happening. And so Grant leans over and says to me, they're picking you up. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like you're an antenna. And I didn't know what he was talking about. So I just kind of went, ha, 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 yeah, and <laughs> didn't have any idea what he was saying, but just went along with it. And um, then uh, Marcel says, okay, everybody, we're feeling this energy in the circle. Let's take a pause. Please take out your photographs, your, your cameras or your, or your phones, and let's just try an experiment. 
So everybody, please point and click, you know, just point randomly around this area and take pictures and we'll just see if anything shows up in any of the photographs. So at that point, I'm still sitting with Grant, still have no idea what's going on. This woman comes over to Grant and me and shows this photograph that she's just taken of the two of us. And in the photograph, there's a little ET standing right beside me and there's a big light coming out of my chest. And I have submitted that photograph to a friend of mine who works for Getty Images, where they can check out images for authenticity, make sure that they're not edited or altered in any way. He checked it out for me. He cannot explain how that little ET is there. He cannot explain how that light is there. It was pitch black darkness. So in the photograph, it looks like it's daytime. There was a light filter over top of it to make just make it more visible, but nothing in the photograph was altered. So he verified that for me. And I also submitted it to my friend Dakota, who's a professional photographer. She cannot figure out how those two things show up in that photograph. It just makes no sense. So it was quite a remarkable day. And so what seems to be happening is they're showing up, you know, over stretches of time and in smaller incidences as well between these really big energetic two year apart events. But um, it seems to be increasing. So now they're showing themselves to me. Now they're giving me more energy now, you know, so, and I'm starting to see UFOs more. So it just seems to be gradually increasing. And um, I feel like that kind of connects a little bit to what happened most recently in New York. A couple of weekends ago, I flew to New York for a UFO conference. It was a wonderful conference run by two guys named uh, Jay King and James Andoli. And the event is called Inquire Anomalous. I'm saying this so people can check it out. It's really great. So really good quality information, wonderful speakers, had a great time. And so I said to my ETs who don't show up a lot in the cold winter months, they tend to show up in the warmer months um, more, a lot more. I said to them, okay, guys, I miss you. You know, I haven't had any contact with you for a while. I'm going to this UFO conference in New York. It's all about you. You know, if you want show up and say hi I would really love that this is me talking to them right so then I think nothing of it and I go to New York and I arrive at about nine o'clock at night have a late dinner get up to my room at about midnight I'm exhausted I'm ready to go straight to bed but for some reason my grant my hand grabs grabs the remote and I turn the tv on and the menu the tv the channel menu is on and I see that the movie the movie contact is on the Jodie Foster film contact and I laugh out loud to myself and I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's so great that this movie is on the day before I go to a UFO conference. That's fantastic. So this is what happened. Essentially, I this all happened in, the, in a fraction of a second. I'm I'm pressing the button to go to the channel where contact is playing. And as I'm pressing the button, I see in my mind that entire scene, the famous scene when she arrives in the other dimension on the on the beach and sees her father, who isn't really her father, walking towards her, and that she has this conversation with this being, right? So I see that whole scene in my mind. Click on the channel, contact comes on TV, guess what scene it was? Exactly that scene, starting at exactly the point I had just seen it in my mind. So I knew that was them, right? And so I just said, hi, thank you for showing up, I just knew. And uh, got back home at the end of the weekend and found this invitation from you to be on this podcast. And I don't really feel like that's an accident. You know, I feel like this is a really nice kind of opportunity to get to talk about them, you know, and talk about the fact that they really are here. Governments all over the world have admitted, you know, it's now a fact. You can find it. Actual real information sent out to the public by governments all over the world saying, yes, UFOs are real. Yes, ETs are real because they're automatically real if you if ufos are and yes we're investigating them this is real this is actually really happening and i love it and i love that we are living in a time that we get to experience this and share this i just think that that is amazing and exciting and i think that it can really change all of us for the better if we wake up to the fact that we're cosmic not earthly well i'm glad to be part of the list of your synchronicities <laughs> thank you <laughs> um let's take a look at that photo you're talking about Okay, I'd love to. Here's the first photograph. Um, this one is not very clear. And of course, it looks like daytime. But you can see one, two, three, four stars in the sky, five, six, seven, you can see stars there. So this is during uh, nighttime. 
there is one lamp off to the left that you can't see in the photograph that was a parking lot lamp it was off at a bit of a distance so it cat a very it cast a sort of faint orange light over to where we were um but it was very 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 dark we couldn't see the cemetery stones we could see the outline of the trees and so this is a random photograph that was taken by a woman I didn't know who's in this circle. Um, now you see, you're seeing the very, very, very edge of the C5 meditation circle. This is just the one side of the circle. The rest of the circle is over to the right outside of the edge of the photograph. And then if I go to a more zoomed in version, then you can see Grant Cameron, who was there with me at this time. This is him sitting right here in the foreground. And he's turning his head away from the camera towards me. I'm sitting beside him. So my chair is on the other side of Grant. I'm leaning a little further back behind him. And then right here, you can see my hand is up. And there's a little being right there. And... Here's the bright light coming out of my chest with these kind of tendrils of light as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then here's a really super duper close up version of the little being. Would you say that that being is standing right next to your chair? Yes. Yeah. And I felt it there, you know, even, even during that experience I, I knew that they were still there I could just feel them and I was feeling them to my left interestingly so when this photograph was taken this little being is standing right beside my chair I mean you can see the cutoff point right you can see mm -hmm. where my body is there and here's the little being's shoulder and there's neck its head you can see the eye right and there, there are other beings in the photograph as well but they're a little bit harder to see I showed this picture to Barbara Lamb and um, she's an expert. She's been in this field for decades and decades, and she's seen photographs like this before. She sees several other beings in the photograph, and she urged me to send it to Stephen Greer, and I did, and I didn't get a response from him, which is totally fine. He's an incredibly busy man. But um, as much validation as possible, I would love to get, because I feel like that that is important. And I, I see this being. I mean, to me, it's very clearly there. So this is just a little guy. This is like a three or four foot high gray, mm -hmm. I think. Why do you think you had your hand up at the time? I was talking. Mm. I was talking with Grant. Yeah, we were just chatting. But we were talking about the energy in the circle. And I was still very, very, very much reverberating with all the vibration of the energy mirrors that I had had just a few hours before. So um, I think I just kept, you know, that vibration was still with me and I carried it with me into the circle and these beings were around. Have you ever asked anybody, why can you see the ET in the film or the digital image, but you can't see it in real life? Yes, I have. Um, I feel like that answer is provided to us by modern science. Um, and modern science is telling us because science is constantly changing, right? And I think it's really important to pay attention to what is progressive and what's new, what's boundary pushing. Um, so science is saying that we are not able to see all of the things that are around us. Our human eye is limited. It can only take in a certain amount of the light spectrum, right? So there's a lot, I mean, this is a fact that we cannot see everything that's around us. Um, scientists have have made, have proven that, not to mention quantum physicists have now proven that we live in a multidimensional reality. So to me, multidimensionality and the fact that the limitations of our human body exist prevent us from having the absolute full experience of everything that's around us all the time. And I think it's also really important to be aware that or at least have a willingness to um, to be curious about how much we don't know about ourselves, about our nature, about our bodies. We're constantly, constantly evolving, learning and changing. And I think we're way too attached to definitions and answers. And it keeps us from being curious and exploring. You mentioned earlier that you surrendered to their lessons. Hmm. Can you tell us some of the lessons that you surrendered to? Sure. So um, I was at a, a major crossroads with deciding what to do about my career, my job, because um, I really love kids, young people. I've worked with kids since I was 11 years old in, in a variety of different ways. I was a babysitter and I was a nanny, a mentor, a tutor, uh, you know, a public school special needs teacher, a guidance counselor briefly. Um, you know, I ran the Gender and Sexuality Alliance at my school. I restarted it. So 
being there for young people was always extremely important to me, but um, I felt like that relationship was getting lost in the bureaucracy of my job and also the politics and all of the responsibilities that teachers are expected to fulfill now, which is a really, really heavy load. And um, if you have special needs students, you are having to create the wheel, or recreate the wheel a lot because these kids have special needs. They can't function in the usual way and they need support. So I was basically working all the time and I was completely burned out. So I was really um, in a, you know, a bit of a crisis spot with it. I was depressed. I was burned out. I was not enjoying it anymore. I did not relate to the bureaucratic processes and the structure of the school system. And I was really feeling like I was at the precipice of becoming something else, you know, um, moving into a very different phase of my life. But I felt this fear about giving up the so-called golden handcuffs, a job for life, excellent pay, teachers get paid well in Canada as opposed to the US, um, excellent pay, benefits, you know, time off, blah, 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 all these things that people, people who many, many people would love to have. And I had this. And so I thought, oh, you know, on paper, this is so great. I shouldn't throw this away. It'd be really foolish. But it was basically ruling my life. You know, I was working all the time. I was exhausted. I was stressed. I didn't have energy for myself. I didn't have energy for my friends and family. It just was not healthy. Coinciding with this was all these experiences I was having and the fact that they were having, they were happening more and more and more. And I felt they were really pushing me towards a different way of being and living and in the world and in the universe. And they were pushing me towards being a different type of human being. And I wanted to do that. And so I realized that I couldn't remain a teacher and do this. And so I had to think very much about, okay, you know, how am I going to take the plunge and do this with no idea of really where I would go afterwards? And I just kept getting <laughs> so many messages and synchronicities that were giving me support, you know, telling me, no, do this. And so um, crazy things happened. I was gifted uh, $100,000 out of nowhere. Oh. Yeah like literally out of nowhere. And then I was I was um, offered a job that was really, really hard to get. And that would allow me to have less stress and more time and a period of transition to move out of teaching that just arrived in my lap. So it was just these things that started to just arrive, including people, people who just arrived in my life who were exactly the right people. Who, who were able to tell me things I needed to hear for support to be able to move through this process of leading teaching. And then on top of it, I woke up one morning and I was feeling very stressed out about the decision. And I heard over and over and over again, you have to jump off a cliff. You have to jump off a cliff. You have to jump off a cliff. And this was not a suicidal kind of thing at all. This was about surrender. And so first I heard this phrase over and over and over again, and that's what will happen sometimes. I'll hear a word or a phrase repeated over and over and over and over. And I just have to listen, acknowledge that I hear it, try to understand what it is, and then ask for more. And so I started doing that. And so it became this, this over about a week or a week and a half, this process of moving closer to this experience that they ended up giving me, which was um, in the end, I was told to go into a meditation. And so I went into this meditation, having no idea what was going to happen. And then um, they said, okay, you need to jump off a cliff. And so immediately, I saw myself standing at the edge of this cliff, almost as if I was in the Grand Canyon. And there was just miles and miles and miles of cliffs and canyons all around me and really, really deep dips in the land and so i'm in this visualization in this med meditation that i didn't feel like i created i feel like it was just there you know when i was being guided through it i'm at the very very edge of a cliff and i'm looking down into what seems like endless bottomless space so there's no safety net there's no you know water to dive into or soft grass to land on i'm supposed to jump into empty air and so in this meditation, it became uh, a very profound experience where I felt like I was actually there. You know, I could feel the wind on my skin. I could feel the sun. I could feel the emptiness around me. I, I felt that I was alone in this giant place. There was no one else there. And I had to jump off this cliff entirely alone. No idea of what was going to happen. 
And so in the visualization, in this meditation, I jumped off this cliff and I really felt like my stomach lurched. You know, I felt like I was falling. I felt like I was falling through empty air with no guarantee of safety at all. But at the end of that visualization um, and that meditation, I I felt different. I really had developed a new kind of relationship, a deeper relationship with the universe where I had let the universe in a little bit more and said, I trust you, you know, help me take me further along this journey, help me even more to figure out where I need to go. And so it was after that, that I was gifted the money. It was after that, that these people started to show up. It was after that, that this job showed up. Um, And then it was just surprisingly easy. You know, it was weirdly, weirdly easy. So there are these moments where I just really have to listen and, and I, this is also where it's important to recognize when it's not my voice so that I can go, oh, okay, I'm getting a, a instructions or guidance or encouragement or whatever it is or direction. I listen to it. Okay, I hear you. And then I ask for more and they guide me through whatever it is I need to learn. I feel like there's some cosmic lesson in surrendering because we talk about it a lot during the podcast, especially a lot of ND years when they're facing some kind of traumatic event, once they surrender into death, then they have the NDE. Yep. Yeah. Surrender Surrender is something that I tell other people, you know, um, to practice surrender because I feel like it's benefited me so much and I want other people to at least hear that word. You know, I think it is incredibly important. I think that we are you know, as human beings, we are very attached to um, having everything be very clear and secure and safe and organized at all times. So we want to have control over our lives. And of course, there's a place for that. You know, you need to have autonomy in your life and create your life. Yes. But sometimes I think we cling a little too much to things and um, it doesn't allow space for other opportunities to learn or experience life to come in. So people who are anxious, like I was very, very, very anxious for a very long time, almost all my life. I had OCD. I was really anxious. And that's all about control coming from a feeling of anxiety or fear or lack, right? So I think that we are conditioned and taught in our society and culture to feel lack and to feel fear. I do think that's true. And I think we need to look at that and think about, you know, well, why? Why do I need to feel this way? How accurate? is it really for me to feel this all the time? And is there any purpose in me feeling on guard all the time so I can be quote unquote safe? Like really, is that a good way to live? Because we have to live life the fullest that we can, no matter what is going around on around us. And right now we're living in a world where everything seems to be going bonkers and turning upside down. And we could get really scared and really anxious and and try really hard to control everything to make sure that we still feel okay. But my experience has been that what gives me more, the most relief and the most reassurance and the most calm is the complete opposite, is letting go and surrendering. And that doesn't mean being passive. And that doesn't mean letting people steamroll roll over me. It's not a passive position. It's actually quite a powerful position. But it involves realizing that there's a hell of a lot going on that is beyond me and my control. I mean, I think of myself as being a grain of sand on a beach. How much the beach cannot exist without all the grains of sand. Otherwise, it's not a beach, right? So one little tiny grain of sand is important. So I'm important and you're important, but only to a certain point. You know, there's so much more going on around us that we need to be part of. And if we try to control everything really, really tightly, we don't really get to see that, I think. You know, that more expanded view of life. Do you think the ETs have any message for humanity at this time? Oh my God, yes. They want us to, over and over and over again, their messages have been to take care of the earth, to take care of each other, to um, to really take accountability, I feel, you know, to look at ourselves instead of looking at everything else around us and blaming that or them, but to look at ourselves and think about how we are living and, you know, really taking accountability and responsibility for how we are, how I am in my own life, to people who are around me, to animals, to nature, you know, what is my, how am I treating the earth? How am I treating other people? How am I treating myself? That might sound like, well, how can you possibly make any impact on the world that way? 
but you really, really, really can. And if you think about any great leader in the world, any of all, all the wise ones who have appeared to us right over millennia, they were one person. And we're still talking about them thousands and thousands and thousands of years later because of how they lived and what they had to say and what they thought and felt. So Jesus, we're still talking about him. Buddha, we're still talking about him. I mean, why are we still talking about these people? It was just one person. They just changed themselves. They just changed their own life. But the reverberation from that is so enormous and powerful that um, it really does have a massive amount to do with how things can change in the world just from one person changing themselves. So I think that we all need to stop pointing our fingers at everything that's around us, the government, this, that, and take accountability, like really look at, okay, what are my shadows? How do I need to improve? What are things that I need to evolve in myself to be a better person? And that has a ripple effect that's really profound. When do you think the ETs will fully disclose themselves to us? I don't know if they're going to. I think that, again, you know, when it comes to accountability, I think they're really wanting us to step up more for ourselves, for our planet, you know. And um, if I were them, I really, I wouldn't really want to come down right now. I think it's kind of chaotic and human beings are not always showing the best of human nature, right? And um, there's some really heavy political contact uh, conflict going on war, migrancy, you know, millions and millions of migrants, I don't even know if migrancy is a word, but uh, millions of migrants wandering across the earth looking for a place to go. Like there's there's so much going on, nuclear war, the threat of nuclear war, the economy. There's so much going on that is so heavy that uh, it's not up to them to come and solve it all for us. You know, it's not like a magical mom and dad who are going to come and clean up our room for us. They are telling us, no, you need to clean up your own room. You know, you need to take care of your own mess. And so I really feel that the message we're being given above everything else, all the other messages that ETs communicate about taking care of the earth, taking care of each other, developing love and compassion, you know, uh, becoming less judgmental towards others and towards ourselves, all these things that are themes that over and over and over again in ET contact across many decades. Um, to me, at the heart of all of that is work on yourself, evolve yourself, right? Take accountability for your own human nature and your own evolution. And only when we do that, can we really make real change? I think that that is essentially their message. So they are around, they're here, you know, they've been coming here for ages and ages and ages. There are UFO sightings all over the place, all the time. PT, people have ET contact all over the world. I mean, they are already here. They are aware of us. They know what's going on here. And they know that we need to understand that we are part of a much wider universal community and that that perspective can really change how we live on earth. And I agree with that. So I feel like, you know, it is really time for us to stop navel gazing as much as we are and zoom out our perspective. Sinead, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you up for that? Absolutely. Yeah, I am. Um, I think communication about these topics, topics is really, really important. So they can reach me by my email address, which is my first name, and then aw at gmail.com. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Oh, absolutely. Um, things are not as bad as they seem. They really aren't. I think that we really live in a world that is made up of duality and that duality, just like the yin yang sim symbol, they are equally balanced. So what we are being given is a lot of the negative. That's what's being delivered to us mostly through media and maybe through mindset and attitude, you know, culturally and societally. But if you look a little harder, you can find that there are incredible things happening in the world and incredible people doing incredible things that are really good for human nature and for our planet. And there's wonderful acts of kindness, of support, of generosity, of the best of human nature all around us all the time. And all we have to do is look for them and not only swallow what we're being fed. Sinead, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I really love your podcast and I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's so important to have these conversations. So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast.
I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.